So now let me tell you a little bit about the Bristol Seed Swap, how it started, what the goals of the swap are, and how it's going to work this year. So the Bristol Seed Swap started about 20 years ago um, by a small group of friends who just wanted to share seeds and have some fun. Since then, and has grown and evolved through the volunteers and donations that have supported it to become an annual event where hundreds of Bristolians come to share their seeds, meet other growers, talk about growing, and most importantly, have some tea and cake. Today, the goals of the Bristol Seed Swap are to make food growing cheaper and more accessible for all, to protect our traditional and heritage seeds, and to support our local community. So we can't achieve these goals without your support. So if you are able, please do consider making a donation through our PayPal account, which Sarah will share in the chat now. So usually in pre-COVID times, the Bristol Seed Swap is a one day event in early February where anyone in Bristol is invited to bring seeds to swap or if they don't have seeds to swap to, bring, to pick up some seeds for a small donation. Or if they're skint, they can just have the seeds with the hope being that they'll go on to grow those seeds and bring seeds to the next year's seed swap. I now have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker, Liz Sorab. Liz Sorab runs by the farm using permaculture practices with regenerative and instinctive gardening. On less than 0.8 acres, Liz grows over 80% of the food that they drink and enjoy each year. She spent more than 20 years working in specialist housing charities and in community development, and she's an award-winning gardener where she gained an RHS silver medal for a community-led garden featured on BBC's Gardeners World Live in 2002. Liz regularly writes for the permaculture magazine. She teaches gardening and self-sufficiency skills and encourages thousands of people to take up their trials and live their dreams through a vibrant YouTube channel called Liz Zorab by the Farm. Liz is also an author, having just published her first book, I Got My First One, about two hours ago, which is very exciting. Um, and this is very kindly said that any book sales from two o'clock today that are made through her website, one pound will be donated to the Bristol Seed Swap. This will run from two o'clock today until midnight on Sunday. So thank you very much for that, Liz. It's very kind. So Liz, thank you very much for joining us today to speak about the first steps to food security. I'm just going to share your slides and then it is over to you. Oops. Thank you very much, Jess. <laughs> so um, very kindly, Jess is going to uh, share the slides and hopefully uh, so you will hear me saying uh, next sl slide, please. Uh, but uh, that's inevitable because I'm not great with technology. So, you lovely. Slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, I thought I might start by giving you uh, a very brief overview of uh, what we've been doing here over the last five years. Uh, so, uh, can I have a slide, please, uh, Jess? So this is uh, this is our home now. Uh, it is we are very privileged. I realise to have such a big space to work in. This is about half an acre uh, of growing space, which I divide up into uh, different rooms. Um, and yeah, next slide, please. <laughs> And this is what it looked like five years ago uh, when we moved in, standing uh, almost at the end of what is our vegetable garden now, looking towards the house. And the next slide, this shows it to you from the other angle. So this is about two months after we'd moved in. Um, and next slide shows us what it looks like today. So that's the difference uh, in five years of growing. As you can see, it's now quite full. So uh, <laughs> let's move on. Next, next slide, please. So what, what do I mean by food security? And more to the point, what does it mean to you? So I've been having a really good think about, about this. And I actually think it's not a single thing. I think it, and I think it rightly should mean different things to different people. So it could be that food security for you is about having all of your food stored at home and it's all bought from the shop and you just feel comfortable knowing it's there. Or it could be that you just, you just want to know that it's not going to run out in the shops. It could be um, producing at the other end every single thing that you consume. So it could be all your food, all your drink, 
Um, I think that that in this climate is really difficult. Uh, if like me, you are a tea or a coffee drinker, you like bananas or citrus fruit, that's actually going to make it really, really hard to achieve. So the next bit down uh, from that, next slide please Jess, is growing most of your food. And that's the point that we're at where we grow as much of our fruit and vegetable as we can uh, in any given year. Um, but there are still things that we, we buy from the stores on a very regular basis. And that's, to me, is a, is a good thing because it allows us to have an even more uh, varied diet. Because as Jess said, uh, kale for several months in a row is dull to say the least. So your food security could then just be growing some of your food, or it could be uh, growing a few specific foods, particularly ones that are more expensive uh, in the stores. So it's really nice to know that you will have that food from your growing space and you're securing those things, weather permitting. Next slide, please, Jess. Um, or it could be that you want to become uh, food secure in just one specific food at a time. And I've got parsley here as an example. I've been reading quite a lot recently online, people saying how uh, annoyed or sad they are that they haven't been able to get fresh herbs in the supermarkets and that they, they've come to rely on fresh herbs. And it's one of those things that's really easy to grow uh, a selection of herbs on your kitchen windowsill and then you've got them and you're secure in those things all year round. The final, uh, the final category uh, of food security that I've thought about is, is growing quite a wide range of foods that you use to top up your regular weekly or monthly shop. And that's a really nice place to be. It reduces your bills a little bit uh, and, and provides some security. So next slide, please, Jess. So why on earth, why on earth would you want to be, uh, to be thinking about food security? Well, the fact that you're here and uh, listening to me dribbling on means that it has started, you have started thinking about it. But some of the reasons you might want to look at food security are social and political changes. So things like a Brexit, the pandemic that we're going through, and whoever knows what's coming next, that unknown future events that could have an impact on our food supply, on the food chains that allow us to go to the supermarkets and pick whatever we want. You could choose to, uh, to look at food security um because of financial pressures and certainly growing your own food producing your own food can lower your food bills uh, without a doubt and it can lower them quite significantly and uh, the next slide please and another uh, another thought around food security is around health um so homegrown food uh can can provide more nutrients on the grounds that uh, many vitamins and minerals uh, reduce the longer uh, uh, a vegetable or fruit is out of the ground or off the plant. So by growing it and, and going from garden to plate in a very short amount of time, you're going to lose less nutrients. Potentially, you've got some fresh air and exercise, although obviously in the middle of winter, that air is a little fresher uh, than it is at other times of year. <laughs> um, and the other thing is for uh, contact, even if that's socially distanced uh, contact with other people, uh, which is going to help, pretend, maybe, maybe uh, help with mental health issues as well. There is, uh, there is great danger, particularly at the moment, of people feeling very isolated and being able to um, be out on an allotment plot and wave to someone from a distance uh, just allows you to not feel quite so alone. And then the last reason, which to me is the very best reason to think about food security and growing your own food is just the sheer love of gardening. So can we have the next slide, please? 
I thought it would be useful um, to think about the steps uh, to go through to, to start your journey to uh, food security. So I've written in capital letters on my notes here. Uh, step one, be honest. Um, so <laughs> I think you need to decide what your reasons uh, for heading towards food security or starting to grow uh, more of your own food. Decide what those are, because it's easy to say, I want to grow everything. And I've got a garden that's eight foot by 12 foot and I want to grow my whole food for the year. I think you just actually need to be realistic about what it is you want to achieve and and about the amount of space you have to do that. Just can we just pop on to the next uh, screen? So when we moved here, this is what I looked at and went, yeah, I'll grow some fruit and veg. Uh, it was really daunting. So I just don't want to say in some ways, whether you have a small space, a middle sized space or a great big garden like that, uh, it can be awkward to know how to, to take those first steps to, uh, to producing your own food. So, and next slide, please. So with an allotment, uh, a garden, a balcony, or even a windowsill, you can produce uh, some of your own food. And uh, even if you have absolutely no growing space whatsoever, no windowsills, no balcony, a garden, any of that, you can actually offer to help someone else to garden and swap some of your time and energy uh, for some food at a later moment when it's harvested. So there is that potential uh, for, for swapping and bartering your time uh, for some food. Next slide, please. The next thing I, I think we need to be really honest with ourselves about is how much time, uh, how much time we have for growing. Uh, because there's nothing more miserable than thinking, yes, I can do all of those things and I'll fit that around my full-time job and looking after my children and looking after my partner who doesn't drive and I need to be driving them. And you realise you've got about half an hour a week to dedicate to a whole allotment. And and if you the time available isn't going to match up with the space you've got and your expectations, you're going to feel disappointed You'll still grow some food, uh, but it might not be looking as lovely as you want, or it might not get picked when you want it to be. So I think it's that thing about be honest with yourself about what you want, how much space you've got and how much time you've got. And then if you realise uh, you haven't got a lot of time, it is possible to choose to grow foods that will fit with the time that you have available. So a bit like housework, uh, you know, housework will expand to fill the, <laughs> the time you have, gardening will too. Um, so next slide, please. So things like um, peas and beans uh, need picking very, very regularly uh, or else they stop producing, they'll go over and they'll go to seed. Whereas root vegetables will sit in the ground nicely waiting for you uh, until the time you want to go and harvest them. And that's to me is a, in some ways a much better uh, use of my time uh, to have vegetables that will wait for me rather than ones that are screaming at me that they need my attention right now. So, and then you also need to think about how much space you have for storing food. And this is just sort of something that you were saying that you don't have, uh, don't quite have the space yet or the or the skills yet. So. Uh, here we have um, four large freezers, four uh, large shelves I use for pantry as a pantry. And uh, we also have a huge amount of preserving equipment. So yes, I'll look at that next slide now. <laughs> um, and I've had to spend the last uh, two, three, four years learning some preserving skills. So this is a, is a very useful one. This is wine making, uh, making from uh, fruits and vegetables. And in that photo, you will see a prime example of something uh, that I haven't grown here. So in the background there, uh, 
it's half a melon. Uh, definitely a shop bought product uh, at the time of year that we were using jumpers. So, you know, we do have that, there's that constant balance of, of what we have here and we can use and what we buy in. And then the final thing, which it's probably uh, one of the most important, I think, uh, with the next slide, please, Jess, is what do you actually like to eat? Because there is absolutely no point in growing uh, tons and tons of kale. Sorry, Jess, I'm going to pick on your kale. Uh, no point in growing tons of kale if you don't like it, if you're not going to eat it, because then all you're doing is growing an ornamental uh, plant in your garden. So I think here uh, you can see I'm quite a fan of strawberries, um, <laughs> and we probably grow uh, far more than, than a normal couple would need. Uh, but I will eat strawberries uh, all through the year. I think you can see just uh, over my shoulder in this photo, uh, there are jars where I've made strawberry into jam, but I also freeze them whole. Uh, I make them into purees. I make them into syrups, so uh, like a squash, uh, a cordial type thing. So I have carefully thought about what it is uh, that I like most of all. Most, and uh, my most favorite fruit uh, by long shot is a strawberry. So we have dedicated a larger space to growing those. One final thought um, about being honest with yourself. Uh, do you actually even like gardening? Because if you don't, uh, either ask someone else to do it for you uh, or just offer to do that thing of offering to, to share helping somebody else grow. And uh, even if that is to offer to make cups of tea and do fetching and carrying. Um, but please don't, don't take on something that you're absolutely going to hate and is going to become a complete chore because that it's just miserable then. I don't <laughs> the only thing I can say is, is doing something you really don't like doing is just not worth it. Life is too short. Either get someone else to do it or just do a minimal amount. So and um, next Next slide, please, Jess. Okay, so I thought it would be useful just to uh, talk through a little bit about how to calculate how much you need to grow uh, to have some fairly good uh, food security. So we, um, when I say we produce about uh, 80 to 85 percent of everything we eat and drink here, I'm fairly comfortable that I can get a meal uh, from the garden all year round and then supplement that with things uh, from the freezer and also from that have been preserved in the pantry. So I feel uh, I feel about 80 percent food secure. Uh, in things like dairy products, it's zero percent. So I do try and be realistic that there are there are things that we have that I have absolutely no food security about at all. But in terms of uh, growing fruit and veg, uh, how do we calculate? So what I've done is I look at one crop at a time or one family at a time. So I'm going to give you an example of onions. Um, so the way I worked out how many onions we needed to grow was we use at least one onion a day, sometimes two. Uh, so, but then sometimes not. So I'm going to write a nice round figure, 350 onions to cover us for a year. Uh, that's probably more, we use, probably use more in the winter than we do in the summer. 350 onions take up quite a lot of space in the garden. Um, and so I do things like look at other plants that will give me an onion taste at a different time of year. So I grow onions, which I harvest at midsummer and I also grow leeks, which will give me that same onion flavor, which I can then harvest through the winter. So I no longer need 350 onions. I could probably get that down to 225 maybe, because the leeks will see me through the rest of the time. And I also have chives, which I harvest en masse. So my 225 could go down to about 220. And I also have uh, perennial onions, which I just use the green tops from. So I can get it down to about 180 onions 
and some leeks and those other bits and pieces and that will give me enough uh, for for all of our food there's two of us in our family but we don't go out to eat at all so I cook all of our meals so that's probably about as many onions as we need and then I have been through every other group like beans and um, leafy brassicas and cabbages and done that same calculation with a roughly how many do I need and what are the alternatives for a different time of year because it means I don't have to store 350 onions I'm storing 180 I'm using some of them and then I'm using the leeks I hope that made sense <laughs> and the thing about having an alternative all the time is really really useful because there's always the potential that something is going to fail in the garden and if you've put uh, all of your onions in one basket uh, and they all get hit um, by terrible weather or um, white rot or any other horror that might happen to something in your garden or an animal gets in and eats all of your onions if that's the only thing you've got to give you that oniony taste you're scuppered basically but if you've given yourself a variety of foods it's like an insurance policy so uh, next next slide please jess so here is a, a fairly typical um early in the year I was going to say about now but actually maybe in a month's time I think I took this about March last year so you can see there's purple sprouting broccoli and some celeriac and chard it's a fairly typical uh, wintry uh, scene of food there and the next slide please Jess here I am uh, inspecting it's not <laughs> I'm inspecting beans it's that thing of, again, showing you that uh, having a whole variety uh, of different foods to pick at different times of year gives us that continuity of food uh, throughout the year and uh, something more exciting than just two or three flavours all the way through. And the next slide, please, Jess. Lovely. So let's create a plan uh, you now know uh, what how much or you are expecting to be able to grow for yourself how much time you have how much space you have and uh, roughly how much of each thing you want to grow so the next thing is to create some sort of a plan so what you're looking at here on the uh, right hand side I'll have to check then which was left and right on the right hand side <laughs> of the screen um, is the raised bed garden and that is about um it's about the size of a large allotment plot and that provides enough food for uh, not only us but for some veg boxes as well each year so you don't need probably as much space as you might imagine to grow a huge amount of food now for the first couple of years here uh, i created a plan uh, to, to lay out what was going where and more recently uh, I've been talking about intuitive gardening um, which is basically winging it um, it's a very much I'll just put this in and see how it goes and uh, uh, there are two two trains of thought it's a really good idea or it's a really bad idea and some of that depends on whether you want to do crop rotation uh, in your plot or not uh, I don't do any crop rotation um, because I'm not working in such huge volumes uh, that I feel that it would cause issues uh, except where uh, we get some sort of fungal uh, issue in the soil and then uh, I would be more careful with it. But if you want to plan out your growing space uh, there are loads of uh, planning tools available online some are free some are paid for um, so you can use an online planning tool uh, I know Hugh Richards uh, has re recently brought out uh, a, a garden planning course which doesn't just give you a, a whole year in your garden it breaks it down into month by month uh, so it's a kind of a very detailed plan uh, you can just use pencil and paper um, I used a chalkboard uh, and chalk for two or three years 
well, which meant I could just rub everything out and change my mind and, and, and play around so you can do that. Um, and if you're not going to use crop rotation, you probably don't need to uh, plan out what you're going to put where. If you are working in a smaller space, so if you're working in a bed that's four feet by eight feet, you're probably going to want to write down what it is that you want to get in there in a year and just be a bit more organised. So in some ways, more than a planner, it's an organiser for you. Next screen, uh, next slide, please, Jess. Uh, and the other thing I just wanted to, to add in is that while you're busy growing uh, all this food uh, and thinking about food security for your family, don't forget to enjoy that space. Don't forget to enjoy your gardening, uh, the harvesting process, preparing it, uh, the eating of it, each bit, just enjoy that. So I'm sharing this picture because this is one of my favorite spots in the garden. Uh, not a favorite spot to sit, but I just think it's a really nice little space. Uh, I use the rose petals um, in potpourri. I don't know anything more exciting than that. Uh, and lavender. Likewise, uh, I do use rose hips to make rose hip jelly, rose hip syrup and rose hip wine. So almost every spot in our garden, uh, although it might look very, very pretty, it does have some sort of function. Okay, do you want to stop the screen sharing for a second? Hello, everybody. <laughs> I thought it might be uh, useful just to talk a little bit more um, on a personal level of what that food security looks like for us here. Rather, so rather than an in theory, uh, give you a, a very real idea uh, of what that looks like. Um, so one of the, going back through what I've talked about, the, the reasons uh, that we wanted to be food secure is that I became unwell. It became really obvious I wasn't going to be going back to work, but I still wanted to make uh, a contribution to our household income. So I uh, rather madly suggested, why don't I grow as much of our food as I can? Um, <laughs> and Mr. J said, yes, jolly good idea. Uh, we knew that we wanted to eat uh, more and more organic food and uh, the prices of organic food in the shops uh, meant that, that eating the volume of food we wanted to organically became prohibitive. We wanted to reduce our food miles uh, and really take it down to food feet if we could. And also, I love gardening. So those are our main reasons. Uh, and then later on, uh, I have uh, now got an income uh, through the VegBot scheme that I do as well. So tick, 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 lots of bonuses. Uh, our growing space, so that raised bed garden uh, that we looked at, uh, just sort of give you an idea of space. Uh, it's 37 feet by 73 feet, which works out at, my math says, uh, about 11 metres by 22 metres. Uh, that includes all of those pathways and the pathways are um, three feet or, or a metre wide uh, all around the beds uh, because I wanted to make them uh, wide enough that I could get a wheelchair around because uh, when we moved here I wasn't very well and we didn't know whether I was going to end up in a wheelchair or not so they're quite wide pathways so you could take out about half of that size uh, if you were if you <laughs> if you made the pathways much narrower. The uh, uh, allotment style market garden, allotment, sorry, the allotment size market garden that we've got is about uh, 24 feet by 40 feet. And I predominantly use that to raise uh, food for the veg boxes. In terms of time, uh, I do this almost as a full time job. So I'm in that fortunate position where I can just uh, dedicate my time mostly uh, to producing food. Um, but I also, that's kind of a full-time job, but I also uh, run my YouTube channel as a full-time job uh, and I write as a full-time job and I run the VegBot scheme, which is a part-time job. Uh, and luckily, all of that is seasonal. So I work huge amounts in the summer, um, spring, summer and autumn, and I take winter off, which suits me just fine. 
so as I said, uh, for the first two years or so, I planned where everything was going in the garden meticulously, did, uh, did crop, really strict crop rotation. And in the third year, decided I would just start using polycultures. So all my planning got thrown out of the window. And now uh, I use intuitive gardening, winging it. Should we go back to sharing a, sharing a screen, Jess? I'm almost there. I will fly through uh, these last few slides just to give you some ideas of, uh, of what I practically did when we first moved here. So my very first steps uh, when we moved here after I'd gone, oh, that's a big space, uh, was to start making some compost heaps. So <laughs> the next slide please shows you, um, thank you Jess. So this is the very first compost heap I made. Uh, spot the mistake, it's not deliberate. Uh, there is a palette there, or maybe even two, that are painted a colour, which means that they have probably been treated with some unpleasant chemical. Uh, we've replaced those as soon as I found out that might be the case. Um, but that was our first one. And the next slide, please. So my first year here was about making raised beds and making compost. And so here are two more. Uh, there's a Dalek compost bin and just this hoop of netting, which was just some pig netting uh, that we found lying around, made it into a hoop. And hopefully you can see there um, with the next slide, you can see that I have layered uh, green materials and, and brown materials, one on top of the other. I've also put in a bit of garden soil, lots and lots of watering it. And my hope with this was that it would take maybe uh, three to six months uh, for this to become really nice soil, uh, nice compost. And each night when we put the ducks to bed, I took their, their bucket of water and tipped it over it. And um, the next slide shows you, uh, this is what it turned into in three weeks, 23 days from start to finish. That's what we had. It was just unbelievable. And it was just, obviously the conditions were right. I've just got the right number of layers. It was having enough water and enough oxygen. And I've got to say, I've never been able to replicate it, but I do want to share it because it feels like a, a wonderful achievement to be able to, to turn uh, garden waste into uh, a growing medium. You can still see some of the layers in there. It's not perfectly broken down, but it was certainly good enough to start going onto our raised beds. And the next slide, please, Jess. So one of the things that we were doing uh, while all those composts were making was we were starting to make, and the next one, please. We were starting to make our first raised beds. And while uh, we were building these, these are from uh, recycled wood uh, that we bought from an office uh, that was being, all their internal walls were being taken down. So we bought the wood it was covered in nails and screws, masses of work to take them out, but uh, did make some very nice edges to raise beds. While we were making those, uh, I got those little lettuces growing. Um, and we used all raised beds here because the soil was is just incredibly poor. Um, so I decided I needed raised beds. Um, and rather than uh, use the wisdom of Charles Dowling and just make them on the ground. I got it in my head, they had to be raised up. Uh, so, <laughs> so I then needed uh, probably more soil and compost to go in them than was necessary. And the other thing that I did were when I ran out of wood um, and energy, uh, but not enthusiasm, was to make, look around and see what else I could make raised beds from. And um, so in the next slide, uh, I got hold of a load of cardboard boxes, threw compost into those. Uh, they make jolly good uh, raised beds. And the next slide. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Uh, so all the time I'm making raised beds and, uh, and growing more seedlings. I also used uh, those raised beds for things like growing beans. And next slide, please, Jess. And here you can see uh, another cardboard box bed. And this time uh, I've used recycled hazel poles uh, to make 
probably the most wobbly bean structure ever going. Um, one puff of wind and that came down. <laughs> and that's one of the things that we learned as we went along there. We needed to learn and learn quickly. Uh, so I'm going to show you a few things now that we learned about uh, bean supports. Don't make wobbly bean supports. Uh, if you could do the next slide, please. Uh, because uh, when the wind comes, uh, this is what happens. They, <laughs> they will get this really nice lean, which is great for harvesting the ones on the one side and terrible for trying to harvest them on the other side. And it's not great just for walking up and down the pathways either. And in the end, uh, I gave up with these uh, rather wobbly bean structures. Uh, and on the next slide, you'll see, uh, we ended up making this really sturdy support. Uh, and you can see that the, the canes uh, come out rather than inward. So it's like an inverted A which allows the beans to hang down uh, over the pathways, make them really, really easy to harvest. Let's rattle through. I'm really conscious of time. So <laughs> uh, next slide, please, Jess. Uh, so because I can't grow uh, and well, because I can't store enough potatoes uh, for our needs throughout the year, we've looked at what else we can grow that we'll keep. So we use squashes. Uh, for our kind of carby, warming winter foods. Uh, squashes are great. Winter squash will store once they've been cured for months and months and months. Uh, but they do take up quite a lot of space growing across the floor. So next slide, please. So I've done quite a lot of experimenting with getting them up uh, and over archways. This is a piece of pig netting again and some bits of two by one shoved into the ground. It's not permanent, it's not glamorous, but it took them well out of head height, uh, which meant you could just grow that many more of them. And the next three slides, uh, we can pop through fairly quickly. Uh, I, protect, uh, I protect our cabbages nowadays uh, from these fellas or girls. And um, our first year, next slide, be lovely. Our first year, uh, all our cabbages look like this. Uh, paper doilies, really lacy doilies, uh, and they were filled with caterpillar poo and caterpillar and slugs. Uh, they weren't very pleasant, to be honest. Uh, so after that, next slide please, uh, after that I got smart and um, I found some piping being thrown away, some bamboo canes, and bought this um, debris netting, it's scaffold debris netting, uh, and planted my uh, brassicas in under there. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Um, and Jess, next slide, please. And you can see uh, this photo was taken about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago. And even now, the leaves are looking not too nibbled, which is uh, which I'm very pleased about. So I highly recommend that. It's a really cheap way of keeping your food safe from caterpillars. So I've just got last three, maybe four tiny things I want to share with you. Uh, you must be kind of fed up. In fact, we've probably lost people going, she's wittering again. So <laughs> uh, some hints and tips. Uh, if you are starting a, on your allotment, uh, either from scratch uh, or, or your garden, um, or just going back in at this time of year to start again, and it's a complete mess and you don't know where to begin, work with your back to the mess and just look at the bit that you are doing and that what you have done and that way you won't get overwhelmed by the amount of work there is left to do. Uh, use the wonderful system of swapping. Uh, so I've written swap, barter, swap again. Uh, so that can be anything from seeds, seedlings, plants, your time and energy and also uh, your knowledge and experience Although uh, I would advise that you only offer your knowledge and experience if you've been invited to, because some people uh, don't necessarily want unsolicited advice. Uh, and also swap uh, any gluts you have of, of any harvest. So if you've got spare anything, uh, swap them and that way you get a wider variety. 
don't be put off by failures. Uh, they aren't failures. They are just uh, one more way you can tick something off a list and say, no, nope, that isn't the right way to do something. And last of all, um, celebrate absolutely every success. There you go, Jess. <laughs> Okay, Jess, you are on mute. There we go. I am on mute and trying to get the technology to work with me. So Thank you, Liz. That was amazing. <laughs> I just want to say that people are, are really loving it. And you, you got a lot of nice things saying about your talk in the chat. Like, yeah, thank you. That was lovely. So positive. And yeah, stuff that it, it's going too fast for me to read. But yeah, you did a great talk. That was, that was really inspiring. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Sarah, have you got some questions for us? Were there questions in the chat? I do. I just hope that um, if I don't ask your questions and you feel that I might have missed it, ju just repost it in the chat and we'll do through as many questions as we can in the like 15 minutes or so we have. So the first question somebody had was, um, can you tell us how many veg boxes you are capable of providing each year? Um, last year I did uh, 20 shares, um, but actually the, that space has the capacity, I think, to do comfortably 40. I don't have the capacity, but that space does. That's quite impressive, 40. Uh, somebody else was asking, how important is the soil for gardening? Do you have any advice on maintaining a healthy soil, especially for potted plants? Oh, for potted plants. So I I'm assuming you'll talk about plants in containers rather than just, you know, very sized containers. Um, I think if you uh, make your own compost, if you mulch, if you make feed from comfrey, from nettles, or even uh, from weeds that you've pulled out of the ground, put them in a barrel of water, they will rot down and produce a feed very quickly. You can keep your soil supported, but it will need more organic matter and it will need feeding, but just don't overfeed it. Thank you for that. Uh, do you use polycultures in the market garden as well as your family food growing? Sorry, say that again. Do you use polycultures in the market garden as well as your family food growing? Yes, absolutely. So I use polycultures right across the site, uh, into planting, um, everything all the time. And there are now increasingly numbers of perennial vegetables around and about. That's great. I love perennial vegetables. <laughs> That's the way to go. Uh, is there any chance you would be Oh yeah, there was a remark about uh, your mistake about the raised bed and the person was saying if there, is, there was any chance you would be in a wheelchair, then wouldn't the waste bed be a necessity rather than a mistake? Yes. So I guess you would have had to have a lot yeah. higher. Yes, so the idea was that we put them down and then we could, as we got the wood and as we had the compost, we could carry on building them higher and higher. Uh, but as it turns out, we didn't need them. So, uh, yeah, I was fortunate that I didn't need them, but um, yeah, really good news. And what I wanted to build that that security in from the beginning because it would have been much harder had I become wheelchair bound to to undo everything I'd done to then make it a wheelchair friendly garden. So it it made sense just to, to build that capacity in at the start. Yeah, that's a great and great way of planning. Uh, so I'm going through the questions. Sorry, yeah. I'm a bit slow. <laughs> Somebody is asking about your favourite variety of strawberry. Right, so those strawberries that you can see me, they are a variety that were here when we moved in. There were six plants uh, in a box outside the kitchen and I have no idea what variety they are, but they are very, very early. So they are uh, uh, usually a good three weeks, two to three weeks ahead of all my friends who have strawberries. 
I'm going, ah, look. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it is early as uh, second week in May. It's, you know, it is early, early. Um, and I've now got some later variety ones as well. So we've got them further up across the year. So I'm sorry, I don't know what variety they are. <laughs> Do you know how many different varieties you grow? I've got two. So as far as I know, we've just got two varieties and, and the early and the late. Okay, that's great. Uh, is now the best time to get started with planning for this year's growing? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so over on my uh, YouTube channel, quick plug, uh, I have a whole series uh, of um, videos about planning, about, about thinking, and it's more about getting you ready uh, than necessarily getting your garden ready at this time of year, but getting, getting the thinking and the observing and the um, decision making uh, process. So yes, absolutely, now is the time to be doing that. And somebody's asking just, how did you learn all this? <laughs> um, how do I learn all this? Uh, so I watched Gardener's World as a small, as a very small child. I watched my father grow. Uh, as a te as a late teens, early twenties, I watched Gardener's World, and I read uh, textbooks voraciously. So I went to sleep uh, reading Dr. Hessian's book about vegetables, um, and I have just read gardening books, uh, watch it on the telly, but the thing that I've learned most from is just trial and error. Lots and lots of error. Yeah, the case of a lot of us, I think. <laughs> Make mistake. Uh, somebody is saying, I am hoping to get an allotment by September. What could I be doing now to prepare? Cutting from friends, etc. Yes, absolutely. First of all, you can do the whole deciding what it is that you want to grow. You can be sourcing uh, cuttings of things. You can be sourcing uh, seeds. There are still plenty of seeds that you can sow uh, September, October and November for your garden. Um, the only month, the only month that I don't sow, months, I don't actually sow in December or January. Uh, but it, you could be sowing in January as well. So there are there are things that you can be sourcing um, materials, seeds, um, and also you can spend time down at the allotment, uh, getting to know other people, cups of tea, uh, and and talking to people always a good thing. Uh, do you have any recommendation for what and how to grow underneath trees? What to grow underneath trees? Um, so uh, in light shade, you can grow um, red currants, white currants, uh, comfrey. Uh, what else grows under light shade? You can grow kale in light shade. And then in deeper shade, I was thinking about this the other day, and now I can't remember. Um, there is on my website, sorry, it sounds like a huge plug, on my website, bythefarm.com, I actually have a blog post of of plants that you can grow in shade and it's got fruit uh, and veg and ornamental plants for deep shade and uh, and light shade so there is uh, there are things that you can grow um, but certainly currants uh, will deal with with shade as will gooseberries will deal with some light shade i'm just posting the link to your blog here thank you very much there you go yeah, I didn't find the article. I don't have time, but everybody has the link to have a look at it. Uh, somebody is asking, do you grow your onion from seeds or do you buy in sets? So, uh, previously, I have uh, used onion sets. Last year, I started growing them by seeds, using seeds. I sowed the seeds quite late uh, in the year. I had an amazing crop from them. So uh, from now on, it will be 50-50. Uh, I will still use some onion sets, uh, but I'm certainly going to move towards uh, using seeds more and more, I think. That's a great thing to know. Um, Somebody is asking, what percentage of your food do you plant directly outside uh, for those of us with polytunnels? Um, so I start, uh, I start most of my seeds uh, in 
modules except for root vegetables that don't like their roots disturbed. Um, so any root vegetables go straight out, uh, are sown direct into the soil. Most other things are I sow uh, in modules uh, or just in seed trays. So you know, there's a flat uh, seed tray, um, boxes that you've got mushrooms from uh, the supermarket are jolly good for that. Uh, yogurt pots, all that sort of thing. So I will just use whatever I can to uh, sow seeds in uh, before I plant them out. And that's partly uh, because uh, our weather is unpredictable, as we know, and it allows me to keep things safe and also allows me to grow, uh, to keep growing more things. So I have things coming on for interplanting succession or growing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess you cover your ground more because you're never waiting for seeds to come out of the ground. Great. So I think we're going to, yeah, I think we've gone through all the questions. Okay. If somebody has a question that they asked and I haven't been uh, spotted, please, yeah, you can just repost it in the chat. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, your book a little bit, Liz? Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. Uh, so um, last year, uh, at the beginning of the year, I met uh, Maddie Harland from uh, Permanent Publications, uh, who also do uh, Permaculture Magazine. And Maddie asked me if I would write a book uh, telling the story of uh, the garden here, going from a field to uh, where we are now. So I've done that, which uh, here it is. It was officially published yesterday. I can't tell you how excited I am. Uh, so quite a lot of the photos that you have just seen uh, are also in this book, uh, but there are uh, many, many more in the book. And it's very much, uh, it's not a how-to book. It's not a biography, exactly. It's a kind of a combination of uh, a biography of the field, uh, an autobiographical bit of my health journey uh, from moving here to uh, feeling much improved now and then some uh, how to do bits and pieces in there, everything from uh, how to make a compost heap to uh, my wine recipe. Uh, you can buy that uh, via my website, by the farm, that's by the with an R in it, by the farm.com uh, forward slash books uh, at permanent publications. You can also get that on Amazon, um, but any books that are sold uh, between two o'clock today uh, and midnight tomorrow night, uh, I will donate a pound of those sales uh, back to uh, Bristol Seed Swap to support the work you're doing. That's really fantastic. Thank you so much for doing that. And it looks like a gorgeous book. I'm sure, yeah, Jess, you're able to testify on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm very, very excited. Straight after this, I'm going to go make a cup of tea and have a read. So that brings us to the end. Liz, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And it was wonderful having you with us. And again, thank you so much for being so generous with your, with your book sales. It's wonderful. Um, to everyone that's still on the call, thank you. Uh, please see our website to get your seed wish form um, and keep track of us and con connect with us on, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, if you can donate, please do. It helps us continue doing what we do. And if you'd like to give us feedback on this presentation, on how the um, swap has worked this year, please, please do, we, you know, we grow from feedback, so we, we would appreciate it. Um, here's, you can see on the right hand side of the screen, um, there are the details of the talks tomorrow and on Monday, so if you can join us for those, please do. So again, Liz, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody, thank, thank you also for joining us, and we will hopefully see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>